Welcome back to In Sickness and in Health, a podcast about health and social justice. I'm Dr. Celine Gounder. Last season, we looked at opioids in America and the combination of factors, economic, political, and cultural, that have fueled an epidemic of drug overdoses and deaths across the nation. This season, we're going to look at a health problem that may be even harder to disentangle from the non-biological and the non-medical. There are few problems that have been as resistant to scientific solutions as this one. We're solving the problem of heart disease and heart attacks, and we're solving the problems of cancer every day. But this problem somehow stayed in a problem space by itself. It's devastating. And you might ask, why did we end up so stuck? What happened? How did we get to this position? That's Mark Rosenberg, president and CEO of the Task Force for Global Health. Before that, he worked at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention and was the founding director of the National Center for Injury and Prevention Control. Mark's talking about a health problem that's gone untreated in America for decades. And it's one that he spent much of his career trying to solve, gun violence. And it's what we'll be looking at this season. We're going to travel across the country and look at the history, politics, and culture of guns. We're going to look at how people get them, what they use them for, and how to make their use safer for everyone. We're also going to look at promising interventions both in the U.S. and abroad. We're going to see what a public health lens can teach us about how to reduce disease and death from this particular problem. Because in many ways, as you'll see, gun violence is similar to a lot of public health crises. And in other ways, it is absolutely not. One of the things that makes gun violence so difficult to address is that it's almost impossible to study scientifically. Not because the science is too complicated. It's not. It's hard because our politics get in the way. That's what we're going to look at in this episode. The story starts with the man you heard at the top of the show, Mark Rosenberg. Mark started working at the CDC in 1983 at a time of great change for the organization. When the CDC started, it was focused on infectious diseases like smallpox, tuberculosis, and malaria. But by the second half of the 20th century, as living conditions got cleaner, less crowded, and overall better, other diseases were becoming bigger killers in America. By the early 80s, Mark and other researchers had started to realize something. It's chronic diseases like heart disease, cancer, and stroke. And it's injuries, both unintentional injuries like car crashes and drownings, and intentional injuries or violence like suicide and homicide. This is what people are dying from now. Bill Fagey, the director of the CDC at the time, reorganized the agency around this realization, and he hired Mark to run the newly created Violence Epidemiology Branch. Its beginnings were humble. My office was in the sub-sub basement of Building 3. It was a converted men's room. They had taken out all of the urinals and toilets, but they left all the plumbing so that any time, anywhere in the building where people flushed the toilet, we had to stop talking because you couldn't hear. In 1985, Mark's boss led a study at the National Academy of Sciences, confirming what folks at the CDC had already observed. The leading cause of death among younger Americans, those under the age of 45, wasn't disease like infection, heart attacks, or cancer. It was injury. As a result, the federal government created the National Center for Injury Prevention and Control in 1995. It was established as part of the CDC, and Mark was its first director. From the beginning, the National Center for Injury Prevention was controversial. The whole question of looking at violence was a hot potato. It might seem counterintuitive. Why would studying violence be controversial? Who likes violence? The controversy wasn't so much about studying violence, but rather studying how to reduce it. On the left, they were concerned with the potential abuse of people deemed violent. There were a lot of people who were very wary of the government's attempt to intervene in violence. Some people saw that there was racial injustice in this or that it was directed against poor people. But it was advocates on the right who were especially upset and vocal. 
they were afraid that the aim of the government would be to take their guns away. And for them, guns were part of their life, part of their history and part of their culture. Mark's organization was met with opposition from every direction. Violence is the political third rail of American politics and gun control is the hot center of that storm. Mark knew what he was getting into, but for him, this wasn't political. Tens of thousands of people were dying from guns each year in America. Deaths that could be prevented. And Mark believed that science was key to stopping the problem. After all, science had solved some horrendous problems, both in the United States. They had made big gains on preventing deaths from smoking or heart disease or cancer. You got to remember that in the last century, smallpox killed more than 300 million people. And science had been able to totally eradicate that disease, wipe it off the face of the earth. Mark's boss, Bill Fagey, was one of the leaders of smallpox eradication. Yeah, smallpox. He knew better than most the power of science to save lives. So science was pretty powerful. It had done things in this country. It had done things around the world. And we thought it was time to start to apply science to the prevention of gun violence in a way that wouldn't be political. Mark Rosenberg and Bill Fagey weren't just thinking about the world's triumph over smallpox. That same public health approach had produced dramatic results against another public health crisis, car accidents. To experts like Mark, the way we've driven down deaths and injuries from motor vehicle accidents, it's one of the biggest public health successes of the last 50 years. And it has a lot to teach us about how to fight gun violence. You see, before the 1970s, driving cars was incredibly dangerous. Reason number one, cars were death traps. When I learned to drive, my grandfather taught me on a little red Ford Falcon, and it had a steering column that was a solid piece of steel. And if you had a front end crash, chances were that steering column might impale you like a spear. And in the front end collision, the engine block would come into the passenger compartment and crush you like an anvil. And it was more likely you'd get into a crash back then. That's because of reason number two. There was little regulation in terms of age, experience, or alcohol. Combined with the cars of the time, it made for a toxic combination. In the 1960s, there was an epidemic of young people dying on highways and car crashes. And the numbers and the rates were so alarming that the government said, we've got to do something about this. And they created the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, and they appropriated $200 million for research. What they found resulted in massive changes to the auto industry. Research has produced side impact protection, rollover protection, rear end protection, Seat belts, front airbags, head airbags, knee airbags, side airbags, so that as a result, people in cars are protected terrifically. They also made us, the drivers, safer. We license drivers. We make sure that they know the rules of the road. We make sure that they know how to drive. We register cars. We make sure that the cars that are on the road are safe cars that meet the minimal requirements for safety. And we have regulations for the manufacture of cars. We redesigned cars, we redesigned roadways, and we're redesigning drivers. We took off thousands and thousands of intoxicated drivers. And uh, as a result, I would say between 1970 and 2012, we have saved over 600,000 lives in our country. And that's a result of research, applying science and changing the way we do things. The auto industry was wary of making all these changes at first. But as restrictions and regulations were put into place, it became clear there was a way to make driving safer without lowering the demand for cars or stripping law-abiding citizens of their right to drive. And we did all this. We saved hundreds of thousands, more than half a million lives without banning cars. We don't have to confiscate them. We've found a way to provide an infrastructure 
that makes driving motor vehicles safer. Mark and his team saw it as a template for how to change gun use, but they knew it was going to be an even tougher issue. Emotions run very high when it comes to gun ownership. Many people think it's the most fundamental right of all, life or death. But if science could transform driving in America, not to mention eradicate smallpox from the face of the earth, surely it could find solutions for reducing gun violence. Mark was confident his team could do it. What Mark didn't expect, though, was that he wouldn't even really get the chance to try. The first real sign of what Mark was up against came in 1993, when the New England Journal of Medicine published an article that linked gun ownership with increased rates of gun violence. And what they found was that not only does a gun in your home not make you safer, but the risk that someone in your home will be murdered with a gun goes up 200 percent, a threefold increase. And the risk that someone will commit suicide with a gun increases fivefold, 400 percent. Now, to put these in perspective, if someone wants to introduce a new drug and get FDA approval, if the increase in serious side effects is 20 percent, it won't be approved because that's way too high an increase. We're not talking about 20 percent increase or 30 percent, 50 percent, 100 percent. We're talking about a 200% increase in gun homicides and a 400% increase in gun suicides. It was exactly the kind of research Mark Rosenberg hoped to see more of. But to the National Rifle Association, it was a threat to their industry. And unlike Detroit's automakers, the NRA went into attack mode. They wanted to abolish the whole injury center to stop the threat, as they saw it, of this gun research and they found the perfect attack dog. What we're doing is we are stopping Washington from telling us what we should expect, and we're telling Washington what we deserve. Jay Dickey was a congressman from rural Arkansas, the duck hunting capital of the world. He was an avid duck hunter. He was a born-again Christian conservative Republican and a lifelong member of the NRA. Mark first encountered Congressman Dickey at a 1996 congressional budget hearing for the CDC. He led off with material that had been provided to him by the NRA. We have here a attempt by the CDC through the NCIPC, a disease control agency of the federal government, to bring about gun control advocacy all over the United States through seminars, through the staff members. He had quotes that were taken out of context. From one of the officials that we pay federal money to, what we need to try to do is to find a socially acceptable form of gun control. They made up things that I had never said and charged me with saying that we were ambushed. It is a blatant attempt on the part of government to federally fund lobbying and political advocacy. When we went back to CDC, my handlers at the CDC said, Rosenberg, don't you ever, ever go talk to that congressman. They said it would be like throwing a match on gasoline. They said, don't even think about it. They said, you got it? I said, yes, sir. Never, ever talk to that man. With the help of the NRA, Congress passed the Dickey Amendment which said the CDC could not, quote, advocate or promote gun control. Technically, the CDC was still allowed to study gun violence, but there was a catch. What if that research showed that restricting or regulating guns would reduce gun violence and save lives? Would that research be promoting gun control? In practice, the Dickey Amendment had a chilling effect on scientists across the country. It said to them... If you do research in this field, we in Congress can come after you. We can write a letter to your boss, whether your boss is a department chair in an academic institution or the president of the university, or whether you're in a government agency, we can write to the director of CDC or the secretary of HHS. And if you do this research, we will write to them and tell them 
that you are lobbying for gun control, something that is explicitly prohibited. And so this was a shot across the bow. It was a warning that we could make your lives miserable. Congress also stripped the CDC of the precise amount of funding that had been allocated for research on gun violence. These are two shots across the bow. The battle lines were drawn. A few weeks after Mark's first face-to-face with Jay Dickey. We got a request from his staffer who wanted to discuss some of the data that we had presented at the hearing. And my bosses at CDC said, okay, you can go up, you can talk to the staffer, but don't under any circumstances talk to that congressman. So I met with a staffer. We met for an hour. He went over the data and he was really interested in the numbers. He was really interested in what the data showed. And we had a very congenial, cordial conversation. Then at the end of that hour, I was ready to go. He said, oh, by the way, the congressman is in his office and he'd like to say hello to you. And I just gulped and swallowed hard. I thought, oh, my God, this is really bad. Either I go and talk to him and get fired or I stand him up and say, no, I'm not going to talk to you and insult him and make things worse. Mark met with Jay Dickey, but something surprising happened. I went into his office and I saw pictures of his kids on all the walls. And we started talking about his kids and his family. He asked me about my kids and my family. And pretty soon we had spent a while talking, not about gun control, not about politics, but about families. And the next thing I knew, he had invited my son and his whole class to visit Congress. Mark's son and his class visited the congressman. And I was very touched. I thought that was a very nice thing. Their families got to know each other. And then I did something for his daughter. I helped her get a job. I helped him with writing something. We talked again. We talked again. And over time, this Southern conservative, arch-Republican, lifelong NRA member, born-again Christian, became friends with this curly-haired, liberal Jewish kid from the Northeast, uh, someone that Jay thought was over-educated, and he didn't say it as a compliment. And though he had started as arch enemies, I mean, really, total enemies, kind of locked in this mortal combat, we started to understand each other, start to like each other, and we learn from each other. Eventually, they did start talking about the issues that first brought them together. And that's when something really surprising happened. They started to change each other's minds. Jay Dickey came to appreciate the effect public health research had on reducing automobile accidents and deaths, and he saw its potential to save lives from gun violence. And as for Mark... Jay helped me see very clearly that we needed to let people know we were going to find ways to keep guns out of the hands of convicted felons, but let them stay in the hands of law-abiding American citizens. Jay made it very clear that what we were really searching for were that set of interventions that would both reduce gun violence and protect gun rights. Jay Dickey and Mark Rosenberg's opinions evolved, while the NRA's stance only hardened. And the Dickey Amendment and the shrinking of the CDC's budget for research on gun violence made studying the problem really, really hard. The Dickey Amendment and reducing the budget were so effective that after 1999, when David Satcher left, and when I left CDC, the research on gun violence fell by more than 90%. And as a result, we don't know the answers to these basic questions about what works and what doesn't, what's safe and effective, and what isn't. For Mark, the final blow came in 1999. I was fired. I was the person most closely identified with the gun violence research. Mark's firing had the effect his opponents hoped. It sent a sign to others interested in the issue that this work could cost you your job. And for me personally, it was very, very painful. If you devote so much 
much time, if you take so much time away from your family and your children to do what you think is an important job to protect people, and then you're fired in a way that was both embarrassing and humiliating, was really an awful, awful experience. In 2012, Mark Rosenberg and Jay Dickey co-wrote an op-ed in the Washington Post, advocating for the kind of research Mark had been hired to do at the CDC decades ago. In it, they laid out the type of work they thought needed to be done. As Mark explains, that research boils down to asking four main questions. The first question was, what's the problem? How many people are killed? Where? When? Who are they? Under what circumstances? What's the relationship between the victim and the perpetrator? But what's the problem was the first question we started to ask. The second question was, what are the causes? What's the role of drugs? What's the role of alcohol? What's the role of mental illness? What's the role of domestic violence? What's the role of gangs, of robbery, of easy access to weapons? The third question we thought to ask is, what works? What works to prevent these deaths? It requires a rigorous evaluation because you can't figure out in your head if something is going to work or not. And then the fourth question we asked was, once you have an intervention that works, how do you apply it? How do you implement those things that work into policy and laws? So we said, let's use the same type of research. Let's ask the same public health questions for gun violence. And if we start to compile the research, we'll be able to save as many lives or maybe more than we save from motor vehicle crashes. Jay Dickey died in 2017. At the time of his death, he and Mark didn't share much in the way of politics. But on this, they agreed. Science could show us how to reduce gun violence and allow for gun ownership. The gun industry, however, continues to spread the idea that you can't have both. What the NRA said is, if you allow this science to go on, it will result in all of you losing all of your guns. The NRA came up with what was for them a brilliant strategy, but what was for the country a devastating and deadly strategy. Mark Rosenberg and Jay Dickey's relationship was pretty remarkable. A scientist and a politician who genuinely changed each other's minds. It doesn't happen much in Washington these days, especially on an issue like guns. For anyone who follows politics or watches TV, it's easy to feel hopeless. But Bill Fagey, Mark's boss at the CDC when he first started, said something that stuck with him throughout his career. The greatest threat in public health is not violence. It's not HIV AIDS. It's not Ebola. And it's not the opioid crisis. The greatest threat we face is fatalism. It's this idea that here's a problem and we can't do anything about it. There are ways to ask and answer the questions And there's a lot that we can do about it. We don't have to live with it. And there's a clear road to getting rid of it. And that road follows the path of science. There are solutions. But first, you've got to have hope. We have to believe that there's a way to balance gun safety and gun rights. In this season, we're going to see what science can show us about finding that middle ground. We'll start by looking at the history of guns in America and the different forms gun ownership can take today. We'll explore how race, gender, culture, and geography relate. We'll also look at novel ideas for reducing gun violence. We'll start with one of the most complicated and seemingly least medical aspects of this crisis, our culture, next time on In Sickness and in Health. Today's episode of In Sickness and in Health was produced by Dan Richards and me. Our theme music is by Alan Vest. You can learn more about this podcast and how to engage with us on social media at insicknessandinhealthpodcast.com. That's insicknessandinhealthpodcast.com. If you like what you hear, please leave us a review on Apple Podcasts. It helps more people find out about the show. I'm Dr. Celine Gounder. This is In Sickness and in Health. <laughs>